I'm really happy to be here. This is uh, the, the today and yesterday have uh, profoundly influenced my talk. <laughs> and uh, in my jet lag state, uh, waking up at 1.30 this morning, I started thinking about this. So I restructured what I'm going to tell you. And, um, and I, I think uh, I'll just start off saying a little bit about the Gates Foundation. So we are organized in a couple of major groups. One is based on about US education, the other is about global health. And the role of global health, we spend about $4 billion a year in investments. And we have thousands of grantees, and we are measured by uh, how our investments could have impact in the world. So I'm, going, so I'm talking about uh, implementing lessons learned, future priorities, and where do we go from here? And I'm gonna talk about two futures. Um, so let me just start off by a story about my boss. So this is a book entitled Strategy Rules. And I really, if you want to understand about Bill Gates uh, and get some insight in the way he's wired, I recommend you read this book. This book is about rules of three successful entrepreneurs. Steve Jobs from Apple, Andy Groves from Intel, and Bill Gates from Microsoft. And it turns out that they actually have some common strategy rules. And as I thought, as I listened to yesterday's uh, uh, session, and I got to know people here, um, rule number three uh, came to mind. Build platforms and ecosystems, not just products. And I've highlighted uh, this word platform is quite important. You know, these three guys, their goal was to build industry-wide platforms that bring together a broad ecosystem of partners engaged in complementarity. Now, in my jet-lagged uh, sleep uh, exercise this morning, I went on to my Kindle Cloud, and I highlighted, I, I read this book about two years ago, and I had highlighted a, uh, certain sections, and this was what I highlighted. What do we mean by platforms? And these platforms bring individuals or groups together for a common purpose with access to some shared resource. Now, I'm gonna come back to this because it should start to ring a bell. Now, I wanna go on to, uh, yesterday I, we, I was in a workshop and I had a talk that, said, that had a title, something like Three Lessons. And I got through two of them, and I said, if you want to hear the third lesson or the third challenge, you have to come to this plenum session. So I'm going to show you what that number three is. And different people will call this different things, but you could, might call it vertical competencies, <laughs> which is a nice kind of name. Or you could, I tend to use the word silos. And this is everywhere. This is, the, I, in my, being at the foundation for five years now, um, this is one of the greatest challenges that we have. And it's not really a bad thing, it's just that they come with some strings attached. So, and it's everybody. It is innovators, both academics and small companies that I, I, I review their grants, applications. It is funding agencies like the Gates Foundation and other funders. Uh, specialized sectors, regulatory bodies, multiple NGOs, the private sector who has its own mission, disease-focused national control program, civil society, we all kind of have our expertise. And the, that's not a bad thing. But it, if you go too far, and all I see the world was through this lens, okay, I'm missing a lot, right? So this is, this is a problem. And these, the problem is, is that if these silos remain distinct, then they are walled off from each other, and there's no co cooperation. But they don't necessarily have to remain separate. And I just love this word. This is my new word, uh, is interoperability. And you know what this means is uh, it's a property of a product or system whose interfaces are completely understood to work with other products or systems present or future without any restricted access or implementation. What a great objective that would be is that if we, with our respective competencies, we are not disconnected, but rather we are somehow connected so that we really know each other's domains and, and that we synergize with each other. So, so I've changed my view on silos being a kind of a negative thing. It could be actually a virtuous thing if we take care of these connections. So uh, now, my reflection on this, this health summit. I think this health summit 
is a strategic platform. Coming back to platforms, this is a strategic thinking platform that fosters interoperability. This is my big aha at 1.30 this morning. <laughs> I just, so I, I've been delighted to be here. So, you know, and here's a quote from uh, Marianne Elvander. Uh, really, it's, it's, in, it's in concert with the definition of platform. This requires, you know, a disease outbreak is a complex thing to navigate through. It requires all actors to gather knowledge from beyond their own field of expertise. Bring your expertise, for sure. But it requires us to go beyond that, right? To be able to fully address the outbreaks efficiently. So this, this is a strategic platform. And, uh, th and I, I just, uh, the people I've talked to, I'm just so impressed. The competencies, the talent, we have talent in this room. Now the question is, is how do we go from a strategic framework to making things happen? Execution, right? So there have been a couple of things that I've been looking into, uh, operational platforms. And the lessons that I've been learning from this really fall into kind of four buckets. One is governance. The other is engagement with both what I call supply and demand stakeholders. The ones who provide solutions, interventions, the others that need it. Sustainability, especially in consideration of financing and equity. So the first uh, operational platform that I am just, in, just so impressed with is the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Framework. Raise your hand if you've ever heard of this, the PIP framework. This is a, uh, a WHO-led uh, consortium of countries who are uh, in the midst of uh, an influenza uh, outbreak. Uh, it, it started uh, with the avian flu. Um, and there's a real need to have vaccines that are prepared for influenza viruses of pandemic potential. So the PIP framework evolved out of an equity crisis. And Indonesia in 2000, the early 2000s um, decided that the rules weren't being followed and that uh, vaccine manufacturers and others were taking advantage of viable IP and there was no benefit conferred. And so the PIP framework was a response to not only take care of let's make sure we share biological materials, the viruses, because those are critical for for manufacturers to develop either diagnostics or vaccines or drugs, but let's also make sure that the benefits are accrued back to the countries. So the PIP framework is a, it was a response to address equity. And there's just been uh, last year a review of the, the first few years of the PIP framework, and they're actually doing really well. By no means perfect, room for improvement, absolutely. But uh, um, through mechanisms, uh, these uh, standard material transfer agreements, they ensured that there was a legal agreement uh, saying, what are the rules of engagement? So uh, these material transfer agreements ensured virus sharing and benefit equity. Then there uh, were up to 350 million doses of influenza vaccines are available in time for an epidemic, a pandemic, if a particular strain became a pandemic. And the really interesting thing on, on the financing is that manufacturers get access to the materials, they can make vaccines, but in return for that, they fund 50% of the operational cost for the, the 150 some odd labs that are present in the framework. So this GISSERS group is the Global Influenza Surveillance Response System. It's a collection of, of multiple labs, all of whom are collaborating to make sure these, these strains get uh, analyzed and that vaccines are, are able to be created or diagnostics or drugs for potentially pandemic uh, strains of influenza. So this PIP framework, if you ever get a chance to dig into this, we can learn a ton. If we're going after one health as a uh, broad paradigm, lots of lessons learned here. The second one is a completely alternative platform. And it's something that I, I also have looked into with great detail, and it's the formation of Gavi. And the question for this paper, which was a social science and medicine paper, was entitled, A New Approach to Global Health Institutions. 
a case study of the new vaccine introduction and the formation of the Gavi Alliance. Again, a fascinating story about how this emerged. But Gavi is a, uh, a, a consortium of supply and demand stakeholders. There are the countries who are sitting at the table who, although vaccines were available, were just not present in these countries. Why was that? So the Gavi Alliance brought the countries together and brought vaccine manufacturers, vaccine manufacturers who were not interested in coming to these markets. Why should we do that? It's a, too much of an opportunity cost. So the Gavi Alliance brought the supply stakeholders to the table. And then there were several facilitators and they went after kind of, well, let's make sure we have healthy, healthy children. Let's make sure that we have healthy healthcare systems. The healthcare systems, if we have vaccines, must be able to deliver them. Let's make sure that we have a, uh, a financing mechanism that ensures joint participation of the funding community and the country. And then let's make sure that we also have healthy markets. Let's provide an incentive for man vaccine manufacturers to participate in these markets so that there's actually a win-win for both sides. So the Gavi Alliance was one, another example uh, of a uh, platform that has been hugely successful and they monitor three things. How well are they doing for the under five mortality rate? In 2015, they were targeting for 66 uh, mortalities per 1,000 live births. They actually exceeded that in the first five years. The number of future deaths averted, they were targeting for 3.4 million. The 3.9 million, they actually hit 4 million. Deaths averted. This is a phenomenal story. The number of children immunized, they were targeting for 243 million. By 2015, they had hit 277 million. So uh, this is an example of two kinds of consortia, two platforms, that frankly, this is really hard work. This morning, uh, Pierre Fomenti uh, talked about the uh, lessons learned for WHO. And Timothy Bully from World Bank talked about uh, the World Bank's efforts for consortium building and forming coalitions. So the competencies required, you, we need these vertical competencies, but they have to come together in a kind of a, perhaps in the beginning, a messy framework. But if we can pull it off, if we can establish those interconnections, then we really have the ability to, to operationalize a platform. So, in this conference, tackling infectious disease threats, prevent, detect, respond with a One Health approach, you know, it's not like we don't have enough to do. <laughs> Let's just pick one, okay? And I'm like, my antimicrobial resistance. So, here's an AMR situational assessment. It's an international problem, crosses One Health sectors, supply and demand stakeholders are operationally and administratively siloed, now here's the big one, governance and sustainability. Who is actually going to provide the international leadership, legitimacy coordinating, coordination and funding to pull this off? AMR, from both a uh, UK publication and a World Bank publication, this is a hundred trillion, potentially, a hundred trillion dollar problem as measured by world GDP loss, okay? Today there's 700,000 deaths this could climb to 10 million per year. Okay, this is, a, this, is, this is a huge problem. So what's at stake? Well, we know that antibiotic use in livestock production, in this case, this is an emergence of a brand new mechanism of resistance for colistin, a drug of last resort, driven by colistin uh, uh, lacing of, of food stock for, for uh, livestock production. Now, this was discovered in China, but if you look at the use of colistin in, in livestock production in Europe, this is a 2011 report. I would hazard a guess that today is probably a lot different, but this was not only in China. So the, the promising thing from an operational platform perspective is WHO has taken this on. Uh, in the, the most recent uh, 2016, the 71st session of the UN, the member states adopted a politi political declaration to create a, uh, uh, an organization to address this and try to avert what should be a nightmare phrase, which is living in a post-antibiotic world. So 
This is a work in progress, and it remains yet to be seen how effective the operationalization of this will be. However, given the, the, the track record that we have, then I think there's some, some potential optimism here. So, uh, you know, I think the statement from this, uh, this particular press release is that uh, they recognize the One Health and we all do. This is the thing about this audience. This is not an audience that needs to be convinced about the virtues of One Health. But the, to have this at a, uh, a, a UN member state resolution is, is absolutely phenomenal. So the future, you know, necessarily is going to be about platforms and systems. But the future is also going to be about you because you're going to be the authors of this future. So what does this future look like? So this actually, I, this is for the, you young guys or your young students or, or uh, interns or fellows is that develop your core competencies, but also develop these other skills that are going to be absolutely essential for you to work in these consortia. So these are just seven habits of highly effective people, Stephen Covey's book. So I won't read them, but they're pretty self-explanatory. These are going to be necessary human skills for you to, to actually uh, pull this off. The determinants of failure, the other future is failure is just not an option. We're going to have to figure this out. And the occasion will likely come. So I will uh, leave you with one mandate. You, you know, we all need to become part of something larger than ourselves. With that, I'll stop. Thank you.